Let's go. <clears throat> we welcome those watching online, and we just give a shout out to anyone that's not able to be here, but to you who are in the room. God is faithful. He is just. He is a good God. He loves us beyond our wildest dreams. And today we're going to learn some things from His Word that I hope will be, or I know will be beneficial in your Christian walk. I think it was Richard said, Richard Turner said the other day, he said, a, a good sermon needs to start with a good beginning. And a good sermon needs to have a good ending. But those need to be close together. So, no, Richard, you didn't say that. I, or I thought, oh, there he is. Okay, he believes it, yeah. I told him I was going to throw him under the bus. Uh, Super Bowl Sunday. Y'all excited? Come on. Maybe not. You think the Bengals are going to win? I, I know what, I know what the... the uh, I already know what the score is before the game starts. Zero to zero. Wow. All right, guys, I'm, it's starting off bad already. <laughs> Psalm 23, look how this reads, and then I'm going to pray before we open up today's session. The Lord is my shepherd. Look how this reads. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for His name's sake. Now look how it's, it shifts. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. That's powerful. I just noticed that this week as I was reading. I, I knew I was missing something, but He, 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 His, you, it, it changed from just talking about God to talking to God. And it's when we're in the valley that we can speak directly to God. Because we, we know He's with us, so we can speak to Him. I pray that today's session would inspire you and give you a sense of hope. Let's pray. Father, thank You for Your Word. It's forever settled in heaven. And Lord, we build our lives on Your Word. Not on man's Word, but on Your Word. I pray, God, that I can step out of the way and that Your Word would reign supreme and be preeminent in the service today. And we pray in Jesus' name. Everyone say amen. 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 I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Fear. Fear is a unusual thing. It, it creeps into our lives through dozens of different doors. You know, fear of failure, fear of heights, fear of closed-in spaces. We, we all could say, yeah, there's some kind of fear that I, that I have. I used, when I was a kid, I used to be afraid of the dark. And then when I grew up and saw the electric bill, I became afraid of the light. Joke number two, okay, we'll see how this goes today. <laughs> but seriously, the most troubling thing about walking through your darkest valley is the uncertainty. You know what that feels like. You can't live very long and not know that valleys are real, because they are. We're all going to go through them. And so it's when you're walking in those shadows, it's when you're walking in those low places, those times of depression that... You have no way of knowing who's hiding. You have no way of knowing what is lurking. What's ready to ambush you at any moment. It's unsettling to say the least. It really is. It, it's disheartening, even unnerving to walk through or to be in a valley. A shadowy valley at that. And, and I'll say, I know metaphorically we all want to climb the mountaintop. Tell me, who doesn't want to climb a mountain? Who doesn't want to scale the lofty peaks? Because, you know, the mountaintop is where we see glory. The mountaintop is, is, is what everybody's clamoring for. They want to level up. Everybody wants to go up higher. But I have to tell you that the mountain is way overrated. Really is. The mountain is, is way overrated. I saw this post this week on Instagram. And someone just simply said, Every dead body, every dead body on Mount Everest was once a highly motivated person. So just calm down maybe. Well, you know, the bright mountaintop is when we see our dreams coming to pass. The bright mountaintop is where, you know, the fruit of our own human effort pays off. We love the mountaintop. We love climbing mountains. But the question is, do we really understand? Do we really understand the beauty of God leading us through the dark valley? He leads us. He walks with us. Yeah, green pastures, still waters, but, but also... There's a valley that we have to walk through, and he, he walks with us. He leads us. During my darkest valleys, and I've had some, 
some, some very strange times. Twelve years ago, I, I've mentioned some things before, but I, I'm not going to get into the, to, the, to the thick of it. I just want to just say that in my valley, I've learned some things. I've learned some profound things. You know, you can't live an overflow kind of life unless you're healthy. Healthy physically, healthy, and I'll, I'll qualify what I'm saying, healthy physically, healthy mentally, healthy emotionally, healthy spiritually. And, and there are four things that I've learned in the valley. And here's, here's the, the, the thesis that, of today's session, and that is the darker the, darker the valley, we, that's where we learn our deepest lessons. The dark, our darkest valleys are where we learn our deepest lessons. And what I've learned is to, to stay active. I've learned to stay positive. I've learned to stay joyful. I've learned to stay confident. And this is what I hope we can all participate in and, and, and invite the Holy Spirit into our lives so that we can live this kind of life. And I'll unpack these one by one in today's session. What are you, what are you talking about to stay active? This is number one. The, the four things I've learned, number one is to stay active. This is the, this part of physical health. I'm going to belabor this point maybe a little longer because it's so easy to skim through this. It's so easy just to, just to pass pass through what it really means to live a physically healthy or physically active life. There's a little scripture in 1 Timothy 4.8. It just simply says, while bodily training is of some value, obviously it is of some value, but godliness is of value in every way as it pertains or holds the promise for the present life and also for the life to come. Now we know that godliness is, is valuable. We exercise ourselves to godliness, but Bodily exercise, we, we just skip. It, it is valuable. We can't skip past this because we need to live the kind of lives that sets us up for success. And as we're going through the valley, we're tempted many times to shut the blinds, close the doors, crawl into bed, lay on the couch all day long, and, and just lean into idleness. We shouldn't do that. In the valley, we should not isolate ourselves. We shouldn't sequester ourselves. We shouldn't be immobile. I, you know, my, I have an eye watch. I didn't wear it today. I, I get tired of wearing my eye watch. I'll be, I studied for this sermon. I was sitting there studying for several hours, and every once in a while it just screams at me, get up, get up off your backside. And it doesn't say that, but it's telling me, you're lazy. Get up, stand up. I don't know if the NSA is watching me or what, but I think the watch knows that when I'm up or down, and so I take that thing off. But even our watches are telling us, hey, Get the blood flowing. I'll just say this. It's important to live a, a healthy, a physically healthy life. We need to get plenty of sleep, good, good rest. When you get good rest, the, they say that there are certain uh, chemicals that go through your brain and actually wash the brain And when you get into deep REM sleep. and So I'm not a sleep expert, but it's important to get a good night's sleep. Go to bed, have some warm milk and cookies. Hey, you feeling rotten? A good night's sleep will make you feel a lot better. Obviously, you want to eat clean, not just eat junk food. And then, of course, you want to get the blood flowing. You want to, want to move. You want to do some form of physical activity. I believe this is so important because when you're facing financial tension, when you're facing a marital situation or a fa you know, there's family strife or maybe a loss in the family or a job loss, you're just depressed or you're down. It's so easy to excuse yourself and just, hey, lack the motivation to be physically active because it seems like a waste of time. It seems so trivial in the light of all that's going wrong. Believe it or not, these physical times of activity can help us stay in the fight. And that's what I'm trying to say. That as you're going through the valley, make sure that you're staying healthy. For example, did you know that during exercise, when you're working out or doing whatever, you're just moving your body, there are neurotransmitters in your body and, and things are released like endorphins and dopamine and that actually aids or builds your body. It's, it's, it's the way God made us and exercise also promotes something called neuroplasticity and then there's more oxygen that goes to your brain. So we're fearfully and wonderfully made. God has built within us mechanisms to have uh, good health and, 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 and to be strong. See, during my darkest time alive on this earth it was probably when I was in my late 30s. Sonia and I both went through it together. It was so dark. It was so troubling. Wanted to quit. Wanted to quit on life. Pastoring a church, but it was, it was something I would have never dreamed. Just, just spent and so tempted to just pull the covers up around my chin or just check out. 
just stay in bed all day long, just depressed. It was a spiritual situation that affected me physically. And so I just I felt the impression of God to just stay active. And so I started playing racquetball. I, my racquetball game came back into play. And I, three days a week, I would just play racquetball. I realized that I needed to, I needed to get the frustrations out. I needed to get that anger. I didn't realize how angry I was. I didn't realize that I needed exercise. And I would go in there and hit the ball hard, and that ball's flying fast. And you know, you're getting hit by the ball, you're hitting others, you're jockeying for position, and it's a very competitive game. A lot of cardiovascular activity. And I remember leaving those games, getting in my car, y'all, I'm not making this up, and I would sob, I would weep on the way home. I needed that release, I needed that those endorphins, I needed that exercise, and all the way. Well, I what I needed was a a, a good cry and that and that exercise kind of pushed me forward and like, I need to address some things inside. That exercise, you know, now sports doesn't build character, it reveals character. And so God was even revealing some things through that exercise that I needed to address in my life. So I'd play golf and of course golf is not that difficult unless you're carrying the bag. But um, I, I, would wa- I would walk with my wife on the boulevard. We'd walk together. She, I'd get home from, from work. She'd say, hey, Simeon, let's go on a walk. And I thought, oh, this is great. You know, Walk hand in hand with my first wife, or my only wife, I should say. And, and you know, we're, we're, and it's going to be a lovely day. We're going to be whistling and singing songs, and the birds are chirping. But on those long walks, we'd get in arguments, and we'd fight. And she'd tell me I was chauvinist, and I would tell her she's feminist. And we'd fuss it out. And, and finally, like, I, there were some concessions, and there were just, it was therapeutic for us to walk. We'd, walk. we'd walk for hours just walking up and down. And that, that was therapy. It really was. Exercise is important. I'm belaboring the point. I was talking to my dad uh, this week, and he's been going through some dark things. So I, I, I videoed him, and it was a FaceTime call. And I want you to watch this two-minute clip. It, it's encouraging to me. I hope it will be encouraging to you as well. Because there are many people that are in the room that would say, Yeah, Pastor Simeon, I'd like to be physically active, but I've got this, this, and this. And, and I don't know that I can. But I want you to watch what my dad says in this short video clip. Check this out. Hey, Dad, how you doing? I'm doing fine, Simeon. How are you doing? I'm doing well. Hey, um, yeah, I got a couple questions for you. Um, I know you guys have uh, gone through some valleys and trials throughout your life, and I know in the last few years you've experienced some some struggles uh, with your health. Um, can you list a few of those things? I've got, uh, I've identified probably around six uh, medical issues. I've got chronic leukemia. I've got either Parkinson's disease or essential tremors. We have not had that uh, diagnosed medically yet. I'm diabetic. I have um, uh, loss of memory. Pretty. That's pretty significant. I have prostate cancer, and I have uh, kidney disease at the third stage. Wow. I forgot about some of those. Well, um, how old are you? I'm 82. I'll be 83 in July. So what I'm impressed with, and I've talked with you about this, um, you could be you could be tempted to just be a recluse and stay at home and do nothing with all the stuff you've got uh, in your life and what you're dealing with. What do you do to, to build your morale and what do you do to stay healthy? Are you, do you stay active? I stay pretty active, weather permitting and mood permitting. <laughs> okay. So I ride my bicycle. Uh, I, I have ridden, uh, I've ridden several times five miles at a, uh, at, at one time, but it's more often I ride it three or four miles and I mow my own yard. And sometimes I walk when I don't, uh, when I'm not riding the bicycle. Wow. I'm, I'm trying to stay physically active. So at 82, um, with all that's happened in your life, do you feel that staying active is playing a, a role in, in, in helping you sustain a, a level of good health? Oh, yes. I went and had a, uh, saw a doctor this week and uh, got a glowing doctor's report, uh, which was quite amazing to me. I was surprised at how good the report, my medical report was. Wow. Wow. Well, I'm just... I'm inspired because when I when I get to be of your age, I hope I have the presence of mind to to stay active, and I think it's important. So anyway, thanks for answering those questions. I love you. 
I love you too, Sam, and thanks okay. for calling. Okay. We'll talk to you later. Okay. Bye. The call was significant to me because I, I remembered, I, and, and I've seen my dad, I've seen him keep a, a, a great spirit about him because he stays physically active. Irene came up to me after first service and said, Pastor Simeon, you know, I just read in the scripture where our youth is renewed like the eagles. And, and Irene, is, she said, I'm already back to the gym. And, you know, she just fell a few months ago and, and broke her hip. And, and I'm inspired when people are going and getting after it, you know, and, and staying physically active. And it doesn't matter where you are on the spectrum health-wise. You can, you can truly celebrate the fact that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, which you have of God and you are not your own. You've been bought with a price. So you glorify God in your body, according to 1 Corinthians 6, 19. I love what it says in Romans 12, where Paul, he says, I urge you, therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. I love the way this reads, holy and pleasing to God, which is your true and proper worship. Worship is appropriately physical. We lift our hands. We, we, we clap our hands. We we pay tithes and offerings after a week of hard work. And, and the, the fruit of our labor results in worship to God. And there's, there's singing and there, you know, there's, we, we are physically in the building. We brought our bodies to the house of God. And so we present our bodies and as a living sacrifice. And I believe that there's physical health that comes from living the right kind of life by bringing glory to God by how we use our bodies. But look at the second part of of, of Romans 12, look how this continues to read, because we're going to segue to the next point, and that is to, to just stay positive. Look how this reads. It says, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So we know we present our bodies as a living sacrifice to God, but then the mind is so important. We need our minds renewed so that we can test and approve what the will of God is. His will is good and pleasing and perfect. So how, how can I live a life where I'm mentally healthy, not just physically healthy. I think we have to have the right mindset. We have to make sure that our thoughts are under control. The Bible says that we cast down imagination and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and to bring into captivity every thought to the submission of Christ, to the obedience to Christ. We submit our thoughts. Don't let your thoughts run wild. I, I know that may, you may not be saying negative words, but you can be thinking negative thoughts. And it's how, how, you, how you feed on things. If you're feeding on the wrong things, if your mind is dwelling on worst case scenarios, or your mind is dwelling on negative news, then you're not going to have positive thoughts. We need to have the mind of Christ and know that our thoughts should be submitted to Christ. And this is, this is how we can, we, can, we can stay mentally healthy. And that is just stay positive. Don't dwell on worst case scenarios. Don't make un, uh, unnecessary value judgments. Uh, an unnecessary value judgment would be like if you're in a literal uh, valley or a desert or a place that's uh, way out in the middle of nowhere and you're lost and you say to yourself, I hate this place. It's so hot here. It's so dry here. There's no food here. I wish I hadn't come here. And you just make all these unnecessary value judgments. You're stating the obvious, but that's not helping you. You, you might be going through something and all you can think about and all you can talk about is how bad it is. It's important for us to lift our minds and, and, and hopefully we can see what God sees and we can respond to life the way God wants us to respond. This is what the Christian life looks like as we focus on the gospel, as we focus on Jesus our minds will be transformed through the reading of God's word, just to study scripture. To, to pour over the pages of Scripture and to read God's Word, meditate on God's Word. L let, your, let your thoughts be lifted to a higher place as you submit your thoughts to Christ. This is what I've learned in my valleys. I've learned that it's so important for me not to go to all those negative places because I'm in a valley already. I, I don't want to just dwell on that. I want to lift my mind up to, to things that God would have. And so Philippians, Paul talks about this in Philippians chapter 4. Look at verses 6 through 8. It says, this is, this is powerful. He says, do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds. Will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, 
whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think, think about such things. This is, this is a mind that's at peace. You know, that will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee, it says in Isaiah. We keep our minds on the Lord. I know that's difficult sometimes because you got your day, you, you, you got your day mapped out, you've got things to do, you, you're busy. But it's important for us to have our minds tuned in to the Lord because there's peace of mind and there's contentment. You know, an anxious, an anxious mind is a worldly mind. A discontented mind is a worldly mind. But a, a mind that's full of peace, a mind that's rested, a, a, a mind that's positive. You know, there's mental health that's only found in Jesus. So let me, let me move to the next point. In other words, not, I should not only stay active, I should not only stay positive, I need to stay joyful. This is what I've learned in my valleys, just to stay joyful, to, to remain in a joyful state. And I, happiness sometimes is from happenings, but that's not what I'm talking about. A life filled with the joy of the Lord, the supernatural joy of God is a, is a life that no matter, it says no matter what happens, I'm going, to, I'm going to celebrate the goodness and the love of God. I'm going to remain joyful. Are you a happy person? Are you a joyful person? What, what is your mood these days? What's your emotional health look like? Jesus endured the cross. When you focus on the gospel, you see that Jesus, the eternal Son of God, said in the garden, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. And then he said, the writer of Hebrews says that for the joy that was set before him, that Jesus endured the cross, despising the shame. He endured the suffering. It was a valley he was walking through, but he did this because there was something awaiting, and that was salvation of you and me, the joy that was set before him. He was able to endure that cross. And so as we look to Jesus, who endured such a contradiction of sinners against himself, so we can also live the kind of life that knows that no matter how dark the night gets, no matter what the suffering looks like, we're going to be able to stay joyful because God is our salvation. So Paul writes to the church in Philippi, and we just read from Philippians 4, but in Philippians 4, 4, Paul goes on to say, he says, Rejoice in the Lord always again, I say rejoice. Keep in mind that Paul wrote this from a prison cell. Some scholars say that this was just months before Paul was to die. He wrote four letters from prison. He spent, 20, he spent 25% of his life in, in prison and beaten by the Romans, stripes and, and beat upside the head. And many of the Roman torture sessions left people dead. But he survived that but was still in prison nonetheless. And he had the presence of mind to write to the church in Colossae. He, he wrote to, I think, the church in Ephesus, and then he wrote to Philemon, and then he wrote to the church in Philippi. And he's writing these words of encouragement. He's saying, rejoice in the Lord always again, I say rejoice. And he's writing from a prison cell to people sitting home eating supper with their family, saying, y'all just need to stay happy in God. This is powerful to me. How is this even possible? Well, see... Rejoicing in the Lord is not just rejoicing in our circumstances, it's rejoicing in the Lord. The Lord. I'm rejoicing in Him, who He is. Because if I know who He is, I don't have to worry about the what. I know who He is. I'm rejoicing in the Lord. In the book of Nehemiah, this is right after the children of Israel had been... uh, they 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 were brought back out of captivity. They had been in captivity for 70 years by the Babylonians and then the Persians. Now they're in their homeland. They rebuilt the walls of Jerusalem. And they've gone through a dark valley. And Nehemiah, he just pretty much, you read Nehemiah 8.10, you read the whole verse. He said, eat the fat, drink the sweet. You know, you'd expect the prophet to say, eat your Brussels sprouts and broccoli. He's saying, eat the fat, drink the sweets, eat your Twinkies. In other words, you know, get happy in God. For the joy of the Lord is my strength. It's God's joy that makes us stronger. It's God's joy. It's supernatural joy. So as a believer, you're walking in this valley Stay joyful. Practice joy. In the book of Habakkuk, the people of God, this is the Old Testament, they were going through a dark time, a time of financial crisis. And the writer of Habakkuk says in Habakkuk 3, he said, Although the fig tree shall not blossom, neither shall there be fruit in the vine. The labor of the olive shall fail. The field shall yield no meat. There's no flock 
uh, for the stall. He said, but yet I will rejoice and I will joy in the God of my salvation. Yet I will rejoice. And the Hebrew word there is, is to jump for joy, to literally jump for joy. So it's all going bad. It's all going to hell in a handbasket, but I am still going to jump for joy. And it says, I will joy in the God of my salvation. That word there, it actually means to spin around. So he's jumping and spinning around while he's in the valley, while things are so dark and bleak. He's break dancing. Come on, y'all. He is having a hoedown, whatever word you want to use. Why? Because he, he, he's, he's rejoicing in the Lord. He's celebrating the goodness of God. He's celebrating the fact that God is a faithful God. That's, that's, we're hanging on to that right now. Some of you are going through something dark. I know in, the, in first service, several people came to me, and I know that a lot of us have gone through some things in the last few years, but I want you to hang on. In that dark valley, you can, you can stay active. In that dark valley, you can stay positive. In that dark valley, you can stay joyful. This is the Word of God to us. Because our life is not built on happenstance or circumstance. Our life is built on the Word of God, the faithfulness of God. And I think we can jump for joy. I, want to ju I jumped in first service. They were asking me to jump. Y'all are not asking me to jump. <laughs> he's, he's, I will jump for joy. And then he said, I'll spin around. Y'all don't want me to spin around. I'll break dance. Don't make me come out there and dance. The, the dancing of the feet, the clapping of the hands, the rejoicing is so important. We come to church, we sing songs. Let's practice joy. Let's practice celebrating the goodness of God. David danced before the Lord with all of his might. You guys remember that scripture? Why was he dancing so much? He danced his royal robes off. They were bringing the Ark of the Covenant, which represented the presence of God, back to the city of God. It had been stolen by the Philistines. It had been gone for 27 years. Finally, David gets in power, and after seven years of leading Israel, they were bringing the Ark of the Covenant, and every six steps they sacrificed uh, offerings to God, and David danced before the Lord with all of his might. He's practicing joy. Y'all, he's dancing. Check it out. He's dancing over the Old Covenant. He, the Ark of the Covenant represented the Old Covenant God had with his people. Dancing over, go figure. We've got the New Covenant. We've, got, we've been blood-bought. We've been sanctified. The Son of God died for us. We get to benefit from that. We're going to live with Him forever because of what Jesus did on the cross. If David could dance over the old covenant, if David could celebrate and rejoice, how about us in the new covenant era? Like We can celebrate that. Celebrate how awesome God is, how great God is. Put your dancing shoes on. Come on, somebody. It's time to dance. It's time to dance. And oh, by the way, a joyful heart is good like a medicine. So there's health that, it, that comes from living a joyful kind of life. Here's the, here's the third one. Stay confident. Stay confident. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stay active. <laughs> I'm going I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to stay positive. I'm going to stay joyful. But here's, here's the good part. This is spiritual health. There's a confidence. There's an uncommon confidence that comes from living for God as a child of God because now we have access to God's presence. The writer of Hebrews says that we can come boldly. And you'll see this on the screen. This verse, I love this verse. Is because, because of what Jesus has done, we can now come boldly. We can come confidently to the throne of God to ask for grace. You say, well, I've, I feel you know, a little shy or scared or I, I feel like I can't approach God. Y'all, you can come with confidence knowing that there's a God who is faithful to forgive you, a God that loves you, a God that, that will wash away your sins. You don't have to be shy or uh, uh, trepid in your approach. You can just march in with confidence and know that you're accepted by God. You are loved by God. This is the God that we serve. He's not a God that wants to crack the whip. He's not a God who wants to lower the boom. He's a God that wants to invite you. And so you can come before God with confidence. I like the way it reads in 1 John. It says that, that perfect love casts out fear. Fear has torment. And he, that is, he, he who still is afraid is not per made perfect in love. Maybe you're afraid. You see, with the love of God comes a confidence that you can stand before God on judgment day. That's what he's saying here. There's a, there's a confidence. We need to walk in that confidence that we can approach God. We can also see God face to face and not be terrified. We can, we can know that going into judgment day, we can have a confidence. Now maybe you live in a life of fear. 
Are you a fearful kind of person? Maybe you are. What do you call a chicken who's afraid of the dark? A chicken. Duh. How many jokes can we tell in one service? I don't know. What's the rule here? Anyway. But seriously, fear is a, fear can immobilize us. Fear is terrifying. It undoes us. It's fear is when we we lose hope. I, I used to be a very fearful person, really fearful, and maybe started when I was five. And I've told the story where I was abducted by a stranger in Puerto Rico when my parents were on a missions trip. Took me out to the parking lot and I escaped. And so I grew up with fears, night terrors. My mom would have to tuck me in, you know. I think it was even up until middle school. I just, just fe- so fearful. Right? Afraid of closed in spaces, you know. Don't like to be closed in. It's the way I was. It had to do with maybe friend of mine said, hey, Simeon, we were at the YMCA, hey, Simeon, see if you can get into this locker and see if you can fit in there. So I get in there, he shuts the door, and it accidentally locks. So like 45 minutes, you can't get out. Some of you can't catch your breath, you're hearing that. But that, so I had this weird fear of, you know, claustrophobia just that was really immobilizing. I'd get on airplanes, and I just have to brace myself. My wife would say, are you okay? Back when we were going through our dark valley, I was actually preaching in Seattle, Washington at a church. They flew me there and so it went great. So I'm getting back on the plane. I had to run to the gate because the guy dropped me off late and I was, I was sweaty and they, they get me in and I'm getting on the plane and it's a small plane, one of those little bitty planes. And I was already dreading it. I saw tall guys in front of me having to duck down already feeling that the plane closing in on me and I was sweating and we, I sat down and next to the guy and, and I peel my sweater off and I'm so hot and I'm just starting to black out and the plane is already now backing out of the terminal area, the gate area and, and going out into the tarmac and I actually was blacking out because of this fear of, of, of being in a closed in space. And I screamed out to the steward. I said, I, I've got to get off this plane. Y'all, I've got to get off this plane. Everybody's looking at me. I said, I've got to get off this plane. Sir, what's wrong? What's wrong? i got to get off. I can't. She goes, well, hold up, hold up. And so she knocked on the door and the pilot answered. And he, he said, we got to let this guy off. So they brought the stairs, the old-timey stairs. You know, they wheeled him out to the almost the runway. And I'm so embarrassed by now. And everyone's looking at me. And they helped me off the plane. And. I'm an able-bodied person, but this has immobilized me. I walk down the stairs. Someone climbs up into the belly of the plane, gets my luggage, and I walk the walk of shame back to the gate, walk up the stairs, go into the terminal, and I just collapse on the carpet floor and weep. Call my wife and said, Honey, I can't, I, I, I'm not coming home tonight. She goes, What's wrong? I said, I just couldn't get on the plane. And she knew she knew what happened. And I got back home, and I... I thought to myself, that's not of God. That's, you know, what? why am I so afraid? This was, I think, probably 14 years ago. And do I have an idol in my life? Am I, what, what hidden sin? Do, Lord, Lord, am I, you know, am I serving the wrong God? Am I unwittingly serving a God now? I have these fears and the Lord just, I just searched my heart. He helped me and I prayed Psalm 34 where David basically said that the Lord delivered me. I asked the Lord. He delivered me from all my fears. He answered me. I just prayed that prayer. I said, God, I'm tired of being afraid. I'm tired of this kind of living. This is not of God. And I'm here to tell you the truth. The Lord has delivered me from all my fears. I'm I'm not afraid of closed-in spaces. Now, I'm not going to get in your trunk after service, but nonetheless, I'm not afraid of because, you know, with, with one fear comes another fear, and they just piggyback. It's like, you know what I mean? It's, it's once you just say, I'm afraid of this, this is my fear. No, don't claim that fear. See, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. And God is with you. You're in this valley. Do not be afraid. God's not giving you 
a spirit of fear. I hope this is an encouraging word for someone today. Why don't you stand with me? I want to pray for you. Lord, I thank you for your word. Lord, as we worship one final time, I just pray you would seal your word in our hearts. Somebody that's here today just needed to know, God, that you are with them. They're not alone. And we're going to go through the valley. We're not going to stay in it. We're coming through it. We're coming out of it. But thank you for reminding us, God, that we can stay active and that we can stay positive, that we can stay joyful, and that we can also stay confident. Give us a confidence. Give us a boldness to approach life with. Lord, to walk into our community this week, to share the gospel, to be unashamed, unafraid. And we thank you for this. Thank you for sending your son in Jesus' name. Come on, let's worship just a moment.